So I am going to actually, uh, Andrea and I were having uh, lunch together and we're talking about others telling one story, an opportunity for one to tell their own story. So I believe that I'm going to take the opportunity to let each one of you first introduce yourselves and maybe even share a bit about what's it feel like to be here in this setting. And then I'll shoot with the first question to get this whole game rolling. I will tell everybody, I think most of you know, because you're in the class that has just come in together, that there will be this shifting of the um, crowd at around 145. So we're going to just kind of take a little reprieve. Everyone knows that it's the fact that things are going to be shifting and changing in terms of volume in here. So please do not feel embarrassed by doing that. And you're good with it all correct. There are flyers up here. If you're at any point interested in looking at the alums um, bios, and I'm sure they will fill you in with lots of good stuff. We do have sign-in sheets for course credit. And so some of mine are up here. Dr. Iope has his. So um, you're set. Just um, you'll be taken care of, OK? So thank you all for coming. So again, would you mind just sharing a little bit about who you are and maybe how it feels? Yeah. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Andrea. My pronouns are she, hers. And I graduated in 2021. So it was um, right after the whole big COVID thing had happened. So it was still kind of weird. I did a couple classes online, finished out the semester, not really on campus. So that sucked. Um, but yes, I am currently a marketing and communications manager at a nonprofit organization in Aurora slash Denver. Um, I have been doing that for about a year and a half now, and it feels nice to be back. I hadn't been back for a while, so I'm excited to be here with you all today, and thank you for coming. Hi, everyone. My name is Ochi, um, pronouns she, her, hers. Um, currently, I work for the Denver Scholarship Foundation as an advisor at CU Denver. I know. Um, but it's honestly a really great job. I get to work with college students just like yourselves, and um, I, I really enjoy it. And I feel like I utilize a lot of what I learned here. Um, and it was also a scholarship that I had when I was in college, so a lot of like full circle moments there. But um, it feels really surreal. I think always coming back to campus, I think. When you're here, you're just trying to get out. Um, but then once you're gone, you're like, okay, that was pretty cool. I like that. So it's always nice to come back and think of all the stuff that you would do. So like, I worked at the prayer center, so passing by there is always really fun. Um, and the life office as well. There's a lot of stuff there. So we're happy to be here. Hi everyone, I'm Kaylee Petro. Pronouns are she, her. Um, I graduated in 2019. And since then, I'm now a health communications strategist. Um, so I work with those big health organizations like the CDC or National Institute of Health um, and do like their communication strategies for their campaigns and things like that. Um, it's really cool to be back. I haven't been back in a while. I did visit briefly over the summer um, with my boyfriend's parents up here and got a little lost because so much has changed. <laughs> but yeah, it's really great to be back. It feels like I was just sitting in your seat and listening to someone that was speaking up for you as well. So great to be back. Awesome. And like everyone else, hey everyone, uh, happy to be here. My name's Luke White, he him. Um, graduated in 2018. After that, I was with Amazon doing advertising sales for about four years, and now I'm doing basically the same thing with Walmart. They built their media business. Um, I work remotely in winter, so <laughs> that's nice. Um, being back here feels pretty cool. I haven't actually been back to campus since I graduated, so that's pretty neat. Um, yeah, hoping that 
some great questions today. I remember, I remember when I was on that side, um, there was some tough questions. And I remember one in particular where like the panelists was like, I don't know what you're asking. So <laughs> hopefully, uh, okay, that's my goal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want you to feel like you want to go back again. <laughs> So my first story, first question is basically about storytelling. Okay, so I'm interested because we work with this a lot as ones are getting closer and closer to graduation about telling your story for career planning and so forth. So what is the story you tell about your career path, whether it be for an, to an interviewer or as you're sitting with uh, prospective in-laws or even um, friends and so forth. So how do you tell your story and what is that story? Can I ask a question first? Yeah. <laughs> uh, who, like in this class, like is, is everyone seniors? Like is that just wanted to make sure. All of you are, aren't you? Yes. Cool. All right. I thought that'd be helpful. Um, I can kick it off. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, so storytelling, I remember when I was, you know, interviewing, going to the career fairs and doing all that and um, taking as much as I could to, like, get out there in front of recruiters. By the way, I think that's really important. Um, any chance you have to go to a career fair, I highly recommend it, even if it's someone you don't necessarily want to work for. It's a great opportunity to, you know, brush up on your skills and all of that. But um, in that, you know, a lot of them ask you to tell, you know, about yourself and, you know, what you do, why communication studies, since, you know, you are a graduate. And I think where I really leaned into that was the fact that, you know, I was a comm studies major. And so that I understood those, you know, communication skills of like verbal, nonverbal, you know, multicultural, Dr. Aoki, shout out, um, <laughs> co-cultural, all that, you know, that that we really studied on. And, and you know, that is such a focus for employees. I'm sure you've heard that from professors, from their career fairs, that this is what employers are looking for, right? It's like, they're not expecting you to come out and know how to be a marketing coordinator, right? They're, they're not expecting that right out of the gates. They're expecting you to have the skills so that they can teach you to do those things. So um, really explaining, you know, what you learned here and how you can then take that and apply it is really um, what I found helpful. Yeah, um, I would definitely agree with that. I think being able to tell your story as well as tell a good story is super important. Um, as you are getting into a career and talking with those recruiters and things like that, just being able to tell your story, being able to listen to theirs and relate your story to theirs is extremely important, um, as well as if you go into a role like marketing or communications related, you're telling that company's story, you, you just want to be able to relate to those audiences and know, you know, what tactics can I use that will just really like touch those people and leave a mark, um, whether you are going to that, that professional field or you're telling that story um, for someone else. So that's something to really think about as well. Um, I definitely think is being confident in what you're saying because you know yourself best, right? And if you feel like at any point you're feeling unsure, it's Think about what's important to you. Think about what are your values, right? And as you're looking at places that you want to work for, like do those line up with what you want, um, or what you're where you're trying to get, right? So a willingness to learn and grow. I think we're always the path that I wore, right? Um, one of my mentors at the career center told me, "Why are you worrying about what you want to do with the rest of your life?" Just think about the next six months, think about the next year, and just take that time to understand yourself and be confident in what you know, because you know a lot, right? You just went through four years of school. Um, you took really incredible classes, right? I would think about my interpersonal class that I took and my professional communication class that I took with Dr. Chavez. So there's a lot of things that you gained, and so just be confident in that, and that will elevate your story, right? Because People only know as much as you tell them, right? So like when you mess something up in a dance, people always say, keep moving. They won't know unless you show them that you don't know, right? Or you tell them verbally, like, I don't know. So yeah, be confident in your story. I'd echo everyone. And also I think for me personally, um, I really focus telling my story uh, based on my culture. I am Mexican and I think it's, very unique to me, like my identity and my privileges that I bring um, to job interviews or whenever I'm interviewing for organizations. 
Um, and then with my identity and my privileges comes like my morals and my ethics and things that I value. And so I always make sure to let those be heard within um, the interviews or within networking, because I think that that's what makes you memorable. You know, like you remember, oh, like this person's uh, Mexican or her identity or her values, her morals. And then um, trying to like, so you said, no, excuse me, so you said, um, trying to make your morals and your values um, be part of that organization, that company that you're wanting to work for. I know that's probably something that you've heard a lot, but for example, I work in nonprofit. And so when I was looking for organizations that I wanted to work with, I made sure that I looked at their missions and their values and made sure that that aligned with what I was going to be, you know, working with um, because doing communications, um, like mm -hmm. Kylie said, um, is you have to really know what you're talking about, who you're talking to, and words are really powerful. And so you want to make sure that when you go into a company organization, you're doing right by their values and missions, but also yours. I think that's really important. So just as a follow-up, you've talked to us very eloquently about how you tell the story. What is the story that you tell? Mm. Yeah. Um, I can go first. I like I mentioned, I'm Mexican. My mom is an immigrant. Um, she came here when I was really young, and I have two younger sisters. I'm the oldest, and so I think all of those identities come into play in terms of. Um, I think that coming through CSU, learning communication skills, and doing communication studies, I really began to realize how important effective communication is. And not only professionally, but within your family and within, you know, your social circles, having competency and being able to conflict manage, um, you know, being able to effectively communicate your feelings or um, things like that. I think that's the story that I tell is that I, I believe that communication studies builds cultural capital and I've seen it for myself. So um, that's really the story that I like to tell when I'm interviewing or talking to anyone else in professional. Um, I think similar to Andrea, um, I always, you know, I'm always like, I'm a Ram because, you know, I like that see Denver, so that comes <laughs> into play a lot. Um, and as well as uh, I am a first generation student, so I think that's always something that comes to the forefront, especially with the students that I work with. Um, they're predominantly first generation, and so I'm always thinking about how can I communicate with them in a way that is good for them, right? Not in a way that's serving me, but more so them. So I think I go into a lot in the nonverbals, right? What questions can I ask? Like how can you really just get to know somebody um, with all the different skills that you have in communication? Um, but yeah, I think similarly, like I lean a lot into my identity, right? And then the values as, as, as well, because, you know, education is important to me. So when I'm working with students, like how can I express that to them and also have um bring that out in them as well. Um but I think for sure I lean into a lot of those identities and and I still pull a lot from when I was in school. Um I've been able to join like marketing and communication communities and stuff. So it really goes beyond um what you can really imagine and, and that's really exciting. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with a lot of what these ladies have said so far. Um, just really integrating what you're passionate about. Um, so I'm extremely passionate about health. And after um, undergrad, I went into grad school and got my master's of public health. And I just loved the research side of it. But I did see this huge gap of not being able to communicate what's in the research and the science of health um, to the larger public. So I think a lot of my story is I'm really passionate about helping the, the public and, you know, um, preventative health um, and trying to help people uh, as much as we can um, and just being able to communicate that science so we can really elevate it and make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, so that's really my story is just communicating the importance of health and, and what's behind that. Yeah, and I think to add on to there as well is um, 
through my own personal experience, you know, I worked at Amazon, now I work at Walmart, like literally the two biggest companies right in the world. Um, and so very different than like a small like nonprofit where, you know, I think it's super valuable, like Andrea mentioned, to like make sure that everything aligns with, you know, your morals, your values, their mission, what they're trying to do. And then your story can obviously kind of emulate that and make sure that there's that continuity when you're interviewing because that's going to be really important to getting the job. Um, flip side of that, mass corporations, you know, harder to do, but they do, you know, create this culture by having this, these mechanisms in place, like affinity groups are called in a lot of places where, you know, there are groups for all different types of individuals depending on how you identify. So for me, for example, uh, I'm a veteran. And so like that's something I identify with. Uh, I also identify someone with disabilities. So that's something else I identify with. And they both have these affinity groups um, that, you know, you could look that up beforehand. It's just an example of something I've done. You know, understand that, work that into the conversation when you're interviewing, work that into the story. Um, so that way they know that there's that continuity and like how you're going to help the business, not just from an X and O's, you know, profit and loss standpoint, but how are you going to help the business from a cultural standpoint? So what surprised you about the transition or from the transition period of time um, from CSU to the workforce? Okay, I can go on this one. Um, I graduated in spring of 2020, so <laughs> everything, <laughs> everything was not even happening. Go on. <laughs> That's all we need to say. <laughs> so I think it was for sure the, I mean, it was cool because we were all in it together, right? Um, but it was everything that I had learned up to that point, I felt like didn't really apply. Um, so I think it was just going with the flow of it and having that mentality of like, okay, like in the next six months really helped a lot. Um, and just being flexible and, and um, being confident in what you know as well, because it was such a, it was such a different time. I think nobody knew what was gonna happen. I for sure didn't know what was going to happen. So it was definitely a time where one can feel very lost on top of already having that feeling of, oh, my life is about to change. Like I'm graduating, transitioning, and the world is like, whatever was happening it felt like it was up in flames or something so i think just being adaptable being confident in yourself and that no one can take away what you know right i think that was also a big thing in that year for me was that you know i was getting my degree and it was mine i put on all the work that i did to to get it and like no take back. like you know, you can't have it back it's mine so it was, like, it was really just leaning into that, like what you know, no one can take away from you once you give it up, right? So leaning into that and that, you know, education is, is power and that was really, really, I think, important for me at that time. Did you surprise yourself by your confidence at that time when everything is so changeable? And Yeah, I mean, I think... Or a, a lot of time for, for doubt, right? And so thankfully, um, I feel like I had a good support system where I had gotten to know professors and, you know, being involved on campus and also like leaning into my friends as well um, that had graduated before, you know, and I kept doubting myself and then like, you know, just keep going. Like we all get that feeling when we're graduating, whether you're a little uncertain or a little bit of with doubt. Um, it's just making sure you have a strong support system and that like when you feel like you can't do it, that there's people around you that will remind you that you can do it because you know, we're only human and we can't do everything on our own. So it's important to have a good system around you. Um, what surprised me was how many rejections I would get. Um, <laughs> I was not mentally prepared to receive so many rejections after doing so well academically, you know, being super involved um, and trying to like build that resume. So I was really surprised um, when I would apply, do the interviews and it would be time and right. Looking for a job is a full-time job within itself. Like there's so much applying, so much waiting, so much interviewing. 
And so I think I wasn't mentally prepared to be rejected so often. And so I think it kind of took a downturn on like my mental health specifically, you know, because you're so good at being a good student. And so now it's like, okay, but now you gotta go into the workforce and do this like post-grad. Um, so that's something that really surprised me. Um, and then also just, you know, working with um, a lot of different age groups, I think is um, something that surprised me too. We all have different um, skills and knowledge, educational background. And so really um, you're not in a group of peers your same age anymore, or like, you know, you're not really interacting with people your same age as often. And so it's a learning curve for sure, trying to, um, you know, work with people who have different experiences, have like an age gap with you. Um, that was another thing that surprised me, but I think in a good way for sure. Yeah, and I also agree. I think the rejection, I mean, I graduated from grad school in 21 um, with a public health degree, so I really thought there's a huge need for public health, and it took months and months of applying, and, you know, um, I think that you may not always get your dream career off the bat, and maybe you will, um, but I think just being flexible and open-minded that, like, maybe this job will take my life in a different direction. Um, like Sochil was saying that um, being open and maybe I'm just gonna think about the next year, what can I take away from this career and what can I contribute to this job to make it better? And what are, what are those next steps look like? Um, I think another thing that surprised me and something that Leek and I were kind of talking about beforehand is that you get into this career path and you kind of realize like, what do I value? Um, do I value making a difference? Do I value a job that has great work-life balance? Do I value working for myself? Um, do I value finances and working all the time and really just putting my heart and soul into this job? So I think just like picking out the, the few things that you really, really value and like focusing in on those and then you can like really find your niche um, moving forward in your career path. So I think like in every position, you're just, getting yourself one step closer to that dream career and you can build yourself in, in each of those positions. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with everything they said, I'll kind of go a different direction. Like I was surprised how exciting it was once I got, you know, transitioned and got, you know, into a role of my first, um, you know, job post-grad uh, on, on how much opportunity that there really is to like, depending on what you want to do. And again, like obviously I was in a larger corporation, but you know, for that, like learning about, it brought me back to Dr. Long's class and, you know, how careers really like, uh, you know, kind of a jungle gym and you're moving, you know, side to side, not, it's not always up and down vertical. And, you know, it, it really is like that. And so learning about like, what do other folks do? How do they do that? And, you know, what's their background? Okay. And I'm doing this and everything everyone says is hundred percent true. You know, you're LinkedIn, you're, you're trying to learn, you know, what it is you do working with folks of different, you know, age groups, backgrounds, demographics, all of these things. But, then, you know, the business side of that is like understanding what do they do? How could you get there? Do you want to get there, right? Would that it would be something you'd be interested in? And um, really sculpting it from there. Because to Katie's point, you know, I think that's the biggest thing for a lot of folks, can't speak for everyone, but for myself at least, and I think a lot of people I've talked with is, you know, as you're coming out of school, it's like, hey, you know, what do you want to do, right? Like, you know what you want to do, maybe, like, you know what field, but, you know, what does that really mean? You know, like, what does it pay? You know, what is the long-term growth there? You know, what are you going to do after that? To Kaylee's point, you know, two, three, four years down the line. So I think really thinking about that is super important. Um, I just can't stress enough what Kaylee said because I agree with it 100% that, you know, you have to decide, like, do I want to chase money? Do I want to really do something I'm so passionate about? Um, hopefully, right, you find something that's a little bit of everything and have that continuity and that balance. But um, I think it's important to have those conversations with yourself. Thank you. So during interviews, how do you describe the skills that have come from your communication studies major in the work that you did? And it, you know, it can be outside the arena, of course, of communication studies as well, because you put a lot into your four or more years here. But overall, how do you talk about your skills from comp studies and interviewing? I think kick it off. Um, I think 
for me personally, going back to the storytelling, just emphasizing that, um, especially in my field, I'm able to take all this data and analysis and I'm able to put it in a way that people can understand, in a way that's relatable, in a way that can really affect change. Um, so just really driving home, like I know how to reach people, touch people, um, and just communicate in a way that that drives change. Um, so that's something that I really like to to drive home in teaching interviews. Yeah, I agree with Kaylee, and I think a big one for me was um, intercultural competence intercultural communication competence. That's a really big one, um, especially with the field that I work in, being able to prove and, and show that you are aware of the you know privileges that you hold, that other people hold, um, and words have power. So you making sure that you can speak um, to empower people, you can um, you know not be hurtful with the words and the communications that you're um, providing from the organization or from the company. Um, that's a really big one, and I think that's a good one um, for interviews specifically because it's important for you to be able to be interculturally competent, in my opinion. And um, it just shows that you are, you know, well versed in social issues, social justice, and um, cultures and multicultural communication. Um, that's I think that's a really good one to mention when you're interviewing if you have those skills in that background. Um. I mean, it's honestly, it's hard to choose because I feel like I find value in this major all the time in the work that I do. I mean, even being here with you all today, like we all have to take a public speaking class, right, to get to being here here. So I think even being able to do that is, is really, really big because there's a lot of people that just can't. And like, that's how I ended up in this major because I wanted to challenge myself. I was terrified of public speaking. Now, now it's funny to me, right? But back then, like, I was scared, like, literally terrified. And that's a lot of people. Um, and it was nice to be reminded by y'all today. Like, that was one of the big surprises when I left CSU was all the different, like, age groups that I was encountering and, like, background. And, you know, I wasn't with people my age anymore. Like, there, it was, it was a lot, right? And so being able to pull from what you learned is is incredible. Like I do a lot of interpersonal communication with my students, and so I always lean into that as well. So um, there's a there's a lot of value here, and I think it's it's up to you to decide what you have found the most valuable in, in your degree. Um, but I know for me, like the big start was taking that public speaking class, and then now even realizing today when people are like, "Wow, like, like you did good," and I'm like, "Oh." You would have seen me at the beginning because it was like it was tooth and nail like i was like you're gonna do it and i didn't want to do it and you want to do it and um my friends really long time friends can tell you that so that was the value that i found and that i feel you like today so yeah absolutely i'd say another thing i recall um when interviewing is kind of explaining just you know what communication studies is you know at a very high level like what you learned and it was kind of already touched on but you know intercultural communication interpersonal communication professional communication nonverbal communication you know all these different things political communication like and how this really spans everything that you know makes up definitely the professional world and really you know the personal world that we all are part of um you know explain that because if you think about it you know like flip the script right put yourself in the shoes of that recruiter or hr business partner that you're interviewing with right how far are they removed from the university setting from when they were there right you know were they even a communication studies major if they weren't they probably have no clue what communication studies is they've heard of it what do you mean communication studies they know how to communicate everyone does right that's probably what they're thinking so explaining you know what that is what you've learned what you've studied and how that really again relates is Super important. So I, I would, you know, give that as a piece of advice. That is often the question. <laughs> so let's look at critical thinking. You heard a lot of that when you were in school. So in what ways do you find critical thinking important to what you do in your job? I think the students here would be um, interested, yeah, in terms of just how do you, um, on a regular basis, um, or when it becomes important, really integrate the skills of critical thinking um, 
that you're proud of, perhaps, or that you've been working on, and you continue. I mean, all of us are continuously working on being critical thinkers. Um, I think I was talking to Dr. Chavez about this earlier. Um, there's been quite a bit of transition at my organization um, in terms of leadership. So there's been a lot of challenges in instability and a lot of, um, you know, we work with the community. So the community asks a lot of questions. We, um, and I'm the one who is in charge of communicating what's happening at the organization. And so I think I use a lot of critical thinking skills in terms of how am I going to portray that, you know, how am I going to be honest about the transitions that are happening and also not add more chaos to the fire. And um, I think that I try to use um, critical thinking so that I can be honest and transparent, but also, um, you know, do my job and represent the organization. And sometimes you have to do a lot of things that are hard and challenging, but putting those critical thinking skills and saying, you know, um, how is this going to be the most effective and the most honest and transparent? I think that's the what I've come to found, find that I use my critical thinking skills a lot in. Um, so yeah. I would say for me, it's a lot of, you know, I'm in the, I am an advisor, so I work with students and um, that is a lot of times sensitive information. So I think, a lot of pausing, you know, reflecting, asking additional questions, um, getting the clarity that you need, and sitting on it, thinking about it. I think a lot of times we listen with the intent of responding, like not actually pausing to actually listen. And so I know with me, that's something that I'm always constantly keeping in the back of my head, right? So I'm working with students, we're sitting together on a one on one. And so I want them to know that like I'm hearing them and actually taking in what they're saying versus like hearing them and just like, okay, well, what about this and, and this and, and that, right? So um, I think for me, it's just pausing, reflecting, listening, asking questions. And I think that's what keeps building that, that critical thinking piece for me. I think for me, I work in a fairly large organization. There's about 400 people. Um, and being a young professional, a lot of people are asking you to do things, telling you what to do. You're trying to learn as much um, from them as you can possible. But I think it's really important to pause and think and be present and say what you have to say. I think like we do have a lot of knowledge being young professionals and coming straight from a university, we have a lot of perspective that we haven't been transformed by corporate America quite yet. Um, so I think just really pausing and having the confidence to say, what about this perspective? Should we think about this option um, is really important because I think when you're brand new to a position and everybody's asking you to do all these things and they're trying to teach you things, I think you have a lot to teach as well and a lot to contribute. Um, so as you're in that role, trying to remember that and having the confidence to say, say what you need to say. Yeah, I agree. And kind of like Switchfield said, um, with like that active listening piece, I think that's huge and a huge component. And then, you know, carries into you know, critical thinking and, you know, really breaking down problems, problem solving. I, you know, I think about, um, for me, like, you know, what I do is very heavily client-based. So, you know, I work with folks from all over the country, sometimes outside of the country, and understanding, you know, where they're coming from, you know, hearing them, like, do they have a family, do they have kids, do they, uh, you know, are they super career focused? You can get a feel for them and kind of what they do, who they are, and then using that to kind of sculpt, okay, how our relationship can develop from there. Um, you know, leaning on those certain things. And then from that, you know, building a basis that you can actually attack those business problems with, um, you know, I think you have to put it all together and it definitely starts with, you know, that active listening component and critical thinking as well. Thank you. So if it's okay with everybody, because I don't want your group to miss out on any opportunity for asking a few questions, how about if we kind of shift the um, way that the usual time Plot would go and wait till the very end for all questions to be asked. Why don't we take a break of, of me asking you? And if you wouldn't mind, 
Um, this would be an opportunity, particularly for those of you that have to leave, to ask the panelists a few of your questions, and then we can shift back into a few of my last questions for you. Okay, is that good for everybody? Okay, so everyone, please feel free to, they're wonderful people, as you can tell already. So um, they're here for you. I have a question for Andrea. So you mentioned about how you were surprised about like the amount of rejection. Um, do you remember like how long it took you to get hired for the after you graduated? Yeah, thank you. Um, I so I graduated in May and then I started my um, position in September. So um, however many months that is, maybe <laughs> four months. Um, four months. But like I mentioned, I think it was really hard on my mental health for like obvious reasons you know keep getting rejected and you're like what is wrong with me um but i think yeah I, it, it didn't take i think i know that it took a lot longer for a lot of other people so i think i'm blessed in the fact that i only was out four months but um uh, yeah that's about how long it took me i have a question for Sergio. um so as a first parent in college student, like, you know, okay so how did you navigate like making connections with people and networking? Like, is it better to pick out like those prior connections with like having children to go into the different college? Yeah, um, that was always definitely, I think I was thinking about that as soon as I got to CSU, honestly. Um, I got my job at the career center, it was, it was a work study position. So I think I got started there like my sophomore year. So, you know, when I got into that space, it was really about just getting to know people. And like when you're curious about someone and what they do is asking them, right? And so I remember my senior year, I think I did like some informational interviews um, with some folks and, um, you know, went out to coffee and just like talked to them, right? And then a lot of the time you don't even have to say, can I give you my resume? They'll just, oh, like send me your resume, like let me know how that search is going for you. So it it was really about building connections and just taking the time to, to get to know people, um, even your own classmates as well. I think I met a lot of really incredible people and that I still see from time to time on like LinkedIn. It's like, hey, yeah, we had that one class the other right? So I think it's about building connections for sure and networking and, um, I know it could be like really scary, especially with like when you go to those career fairs and you see all these people there and you're like, oh, like what is this, right? But I think just what I would do, especially like when I moved back to Denver, um, you know, all my connections were in, in Fort Collins. So I was really, one thing I focused on was community, right? So I was really looking for community. And so I would reach out to strong individuals that I thought were community driven in Denver and organizations that I, I thought were really cool. So I remember there was this one organization in Denver. Um, I think now their name is Movimiento Poder. And so it was during the, one of the election seasons. And so I just did canvassing for them. And so that filled more connection as well. So. Um, it was definitely something that I thought a lot about. And so I tried to take advantage of the resources and like the professors here as well. Like I think if anytime I can connect with Dr. Savage, I'm always like, yeah, like what's awesome, right? And so I think being thinking of that and being curious and asking questions and um finding what works for you, you know, like it's a big career fair does it like reaching out to folks and doing those small informational interviews. Yeah, I'll add on to that real quick too, if you don't mind. Um, also a first generation student, but this would be relevant even if you weren't, is um, reaching out to people on LinkedIn. I know it sounds like really like big and scary because you know you don't know them at all, but you know, seeing if they were just even a CSU alum, if they work somewhere you want to work or something in a job you want to be in, reaching out and and you know, I've actually found success doing that. And I, you know, now since I graduated, I've done that for other people who have reached out to me and um you know, just ask, you can have 15 minutes of their time, ask them to have a quick call, have those questions ready. You know, it's really 15 minutes out of their day and honestly, it's probably something they want to do. You know, everyone wants to help someone, at least a lot of people do. So um, I definitely recommend that as well, like if, uh, you know, you're comfortable doing that. And then I would just add, I'm also first generation, um, finding a mentor. I think that's really important. 
um, because then they can have those like networking and, and resources. They can help you find those. Um, and it would be someone preferably in your field, right? But anyone, any mentor that you look up to or, or want to, you know, stay in connection with is really great too. And now we're a part of your network as well. Like I remember attending one of these panels and afterwards I was like, I need to talk to that person. I believe they still work in the area and their name was Arthur and he was a comm study as well. And so I remember connecting with him and he was working at the career center at the time. And so, you know, just building on those things. And a lot of times, yeah, like having the, when you go on the LinkedIn and they're like, oh yeah, they're a gram, you know? Yeah. Hey. I got one more question. Yeah, you have the spaces, and I mean, I'm sorry, but I don't like holding. So. <laughs> That's always a good one. I always hold that. Exactly. Question for Luke. Uh, did you, how did you present your interdisciplinary knowledge in as part of your like hiring package, like being hired, like whether it's in your interview, your cover letter, uh, your resume? How did you uh present knowledge that wasn't necessarily communications that you also acquired before that? Yeah, definitely. Dude, the question I wasn't going to answer, I talked about earlier. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that's a great question. You mean like outside of comp studies? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, I was like a business minor um, and then obviously had all the general classes everyone has to take. So uh, that, that was a big part of actually what I was doing since, you know, I was going into more of like that advertising specific role, media specific role. Um, you know, I, I would, what, how I positioned it was that my minor was supplemented by my major, which is really thinking maybe it's the other way around, but sometimes I flip that um, in, in that story. Again, it's all about the story and it's all about who you're telling that story to. But I'd say, you know, okay, like, so I learned about these basics of, you know, advertising or business or entrepreneurship or marketing or whatever it is. Um, and I can amplify that through my communication studies skills. So I'd say, you know, coupling those two together and making that story cohesive. Thank you. And you had sports, right? Too, because like yeah, your I was also internship like, was at De in De at the Broncos. The Broncos, correct? yeah. That's when I first got to know you. Yeah. So again, building a more interdisciplinary story in yeah. that way. Yeah, absolutely. And that was an opportunity. I mean, all about networking, right? Like that was an opportunity through a classmate that you know I had talked with him. He was already doing that, and so you know, kind of helped me get the right contact. So, you know, that was obviously for like more of an internship role, but same thing for, you know, full-time roles as well. You know, you hear of somebody who got a job from where you want, you know, talk to them or they graduated last year, reach out to them, reach out to us, reach out to everyone, bother everyone, because <laughs> you're not bothered. Yeah, you can do it can I ask a selfish question for the class? Um, thank you all for being here. Much gratitude to you all. Wonderful comments made today. We're taking a capstone class on constituting community, and it brings together all the things you talk about, interpersonal, uh, intercultural confidence, uh, the ways in which we tell our story and share that passion with audiences, that basic public speaking, right? Know your audience uh, in terms of that. Uh, and the multicultural culture aspects too. Can you say just, bits about how are you building communities for yourself given that our class is called constituting community whether it's in your personal lives or in your corporate and work place life how are you building communities and how is that different than you've already alluded to a little bit of difference with being a student in your peer group right so that's the basic question constituting communities yeah. <laughs> um so i when i started my position it was actually community outreach um, and so I was doing a lot of outreach in the community, and I think the biggest ways that I've learned that community gets built, especially in like Mexican Latino culture, is around um, trust. Trust is a big one, being able to see a face and put a face to whatever is being said, an organization, um, and then also food. Uh, <laughs> uh, coming into community with like a meal, with any type of, you know, snacks or anything warm. Um, that's a really big one for building communities as well. And then um, loyalty is a big one too. Um, you know, once they start, you know, building that community, just staying within that community and not like betraying, that's not the right word, but betraying, you know, your community and um, sticking with your community as well. I think that's what I've noticed. Um, yeah, I think similar as well. Um, when it comes to community, I think it's a lot about coming curious with questions and um, 
saying that you're not coming with the solutions, right? And um, previous to this role, I was the outreach coordinator under um, even through advocacy and family engagement. And the biggest thing that I really took from that was that a lot of communities know what they need and a lot of communities know how they can improve. Um, and a lot of them don't need us to come with the answers and the problem solving, right? Um, it's just coming in and listening and seeing that support and that resource and acknowledging that you don't have all the answers and letting them know that they have the power and that it's their community. And, you know, especially for those folks that in a lot of community spaces, they've been doing that work for a really, really long time. I think it's really important to remember that they know what they're doing, they know what their community needs, and so they, if they don't really need, at least for myself, me, they don't need me because they have it, right? So how can I support and uplift and, you know, meet them where they're at and understand what they value? Just really quick, um, I think taking risks and like trying to jump into a new community and being super over open-minded um and just i think that's how you can like build a bigger network build a bigger community it's just like being there being open trying something new meeting new people it's all good dr mark super short uh i would just say also i agree with everything everyone said on the panel but also that you know there's different types of community, there's different senses of community, and that in a lot of cases, especially career, you know, through a career lens, it takes time sometimes. So don't feel left out, don't feel alone. If you're like, man, you know, I think I feel like all these other people have this like great community or this great network or they belong to this or that, and I don't, you know, like I'd say like that's a, that's okay, you know, come with time, obviously be open to it, look for it, lean into it where you feel comfortable, but um don't also stress yourself out. Yeah. 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 down flow here. So allowing you all to have room. Please everyone say that is able and then we will finish up. So we are going to, I have no idea who's going to filter in, but maybe begin again. Okay. So but you, <laughs> all those were like super easy now. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Hopefully this is not too complicated. They like really super slow. <laughs> Okay, how has your understanding of communication as a process affected your performance in your particular job position or overall as a professional? Only as major would you probably head back to that, right? Since communication is looking at it as a process. And yes, please take a moment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the first thing that coming to mind, it was a, I don't know if it was one of the theories that we learned, um, and it was like a diagram with like the noise. I, I mean, sure. yeah, you got it. You're, you're not even one of those on the team. Yes, so I mean, that's the first thing that comes to mind, right? right. When I think of the process of what is communication studies, right? Is that it's not only what you're communicating, but also the different ways that it can be messed up along the way, right? And then who is it on the receiving end and what noise are they having around them? So, yeah. Yeah. I deserve to be in my major. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was the first thing I thought of that diagram, right? And then along with some of the other, the other theories that we learned. I'd also say, I don't know, this is going to be perfect, but I'm going to go for it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, back. it's like the channel. It's like, what, what is the channel? So I actually have an example that happened today at work. So um, we have an like, internal system, right, to like cut tickets if like something was wrong. And so there was an account that was under the wrong owners, under a coworker of mine. Or it was under me, but it should, it should have been under a coworker of mine, right? So I opened a, a ticket against that months ago. 
and then it got fixed. But that ticket stayed open. And then today, that ticket got processed and it got flipped back. So now it's wrong. It was right. It was wrong. It was right. Now it's wrong again. And um, you know, like so, think about like it was that method, right? That was delayed. It's like a queue system and how that communication process works through that system versus if I had called someone, emailed someone, instant messaged someone, all these other forms that may have been more instantaneous, um, it wasn't. So I'd say like that has impacted, you know, day to day um, on how I do things. Same thing with my client work, right? Do I call someone or do I email them? What are the pros and cons of both? And thinking about that from a business standpoint of how's that gonna impact, you know, my ability to, to you know, plan out this media campaign and close this deal? And, and you know, what, what are, again, the differences there? Because sometimes there are things that, you know, maybe are more sensitive, right? And we're not, you know, it's going to be best not to put that in the email because it's more sensitive. Um, you want to have a live call for that. So I'd say the mode of uh, communication. That, did that pass? Uh, oh, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Um, I was going to say the same as with the um, channel is really important. I think in the process uh, in terms of communication and marketing for sure. Is it going to be a social media post? Should it be a newsletter? Should it just be, you know, a caption on like a status on Facebook? Um, are we doing like any emails like separately? So um, yes, for sure the channel and then also your audience. I think understanding the process of um, who is this communication going to? Is this going to a stakeholder? Is this going to a, found, uh, a funder, a partner, a community member? Um, so understanding the process of writing that communication for the audience that you're trying to reach and how is it going to be the most effective. So I think being in marketing as well, like Andrea said, I think picking that that channel that's appropriate for your audience is extremely important. Um, also, just rethinking. I think sometimes we can get in a rut, and this is how we've always done it. We've always done a Twitter post, but but this time let's do let's try TikTok. You know, and that's the biggest thing. It's like. Oh, I, the fact yeah. getting slammed right now. Oh, I understand. Right now. Oh my gosh, but I watched this morning. Yeah, it was like, it's a big mess. Woo. Especially, we've convinced a lot of our government clients to do TikTok, and now, obviously. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, just, just understanding your audience and the best way to reach them, and uh, rethinking that as well. Like, it may not, how it's always been done, may not always be the best process. So just rethinking that, like really diving into your audience and understanding. That really, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to try not to get too off track, but because you all are so well versed in uh, determining the various modes of social mediated communication. Okay, so are there any ways in terms of your expertise? in your own job position to target audiences that you want to hit, choosing, yeah. how do you make those decisions about some of these more microcosmic, what I think are like, is it Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or Twitter that I go for in terms of, because you know the population or the masses may tell you, because of money or politics, use this or that, this is the way you should go. But how do you decide? Um, I guess back kind of to the critical thinking question, but as well to your communication activities. Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh, um, I think, so in, in my nonprofit, I do all, all of the communications, right? And we work with um, families, with vulnerable families, low income, um, immigrant families and so it's important to again have those critical thinking skills and I'm lucky enough to be have free range with my position so I'm not really regulated or micromanaged on what I need to do which is really nice um, but for example a lot of our families that we work with don't have access to internet or they don't have you know a cell phone or they don't know how to use technology and so it's important to yes um, so for example the media that we use the most is Facebook because the families that we work with are more engaged on Facebook and they are older, not older, but um, parents, you know, older generations and also word of mouth. It's a really big marketing strategy for us, um, especially with the community that we serve. Um, word goes up around really fast and it's honestly, it seems to be the most effective for us. Um, and then also just like paper um, flyers, you know, um, marketing materials. 
um, brochures, stickers, things that they can hold on to because again of that lack of um, access to technology or internet. Um, and so again, goes into that critical. Oh, see, I think that's so important, right? Yeah. Which is not kind of the question answer you would expect to hear, but yeah, because we all need to continually be open. Yes. So sometimes it's hard getting those marketing materials out and doing that promotion um, because you know our families are not really have act, don't really have access to a lot of the social media. Um, so yeah, that's something that I really do a lot of critical thinking about at my position. And I think my company is on a larger scale, so we do the exact same thing, but we have a we have a team of called social listening, um, so they're able to dive into. I mean, one of the campaigns that I'm doing right now is to increase blood and plasma donation. Um, so we're able to just dive into those target audiences and see what channels are they on. So we've primarily found that our audiences are on Twitter and Instagram. Um, but conversely, I'm also working on a COVID-19 campaign, trying to increase vaccination rates, things like that. Um, so we found, again, word of mouth. A lot of people don't have internet, so we are doing those in-person events. We're going to the county fairs. We're out there. We're bringing the nurses there. Um, so I think if you have the resources and doing the research and finding out where your audiences are and, you know, what, what, Will relate to them that's great but also you can do it on a small scale like you really understand your families and, and know how to reach them out so. um, yeah i mean for my role like i mean that's like everything i do is about like targeting right like who are reaching this advertising and that's you know kind of the name of the game so you know for me like one of my friends that was like good year as an example it's all about what messages they're trying to reach, right? Because the, the message that they want to get across to someone who is not looking for tires is different than the message they want to get across to someone who is actively researching for tires and going to make a tire purchase in the next two days. Very different, right? One, you want to reach with like a call to action and you know get them there now. The other one, you know, you're talking about video, you're talking about, you know, your TikToks and streaming TV and, and all of these things. And so um that's kind of how it works in my world is, you know, building up that funnel from the bottom where you convert to the bottom of the funnel to the top where you're aware of something, consideration in the middle, what's that targeting in between and how you have that, that best channel of communication and who are you targeting. Anything else? Yeah, um, I think that's all I have. I've seen a lot of, um, at least with my current organization, is um, committees and um, study groups. So like one of the committees that I'm a part of right now is the marketing and communications committee. And so um, that brings a lot of people from all over. So there's people that are like in finance and then somebody like in nine news. And so it's just bringing a blend of people with different perspectives, different backgrounds and seeing what each person, you know, thinks is a great way to communicate. Um, so I feel a lot of power in that, and so along with that research as well, um, we utilize a lot of research, research groups, um, but then the most really for me is a lot of incentives as well, so like we will, with my team at CU Denver, you know, we'll work with college students, right, so we think a lot of like how can we incentivize students to come to this event, right, um, so like for y'all here, it's probably a part of like your grade, or you had an assignment or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So like when we meet with our students, you know, we incentivize with like food or like parking vouchers or um, gift cards and other things like that. Okay, now you've all been so wonderful. And so I don't want to make you too vulnerable. But, <laughs> but what was your biggest setback and how did you respond to it? Just out. And you can ask if you really want to know, but I think we would learn a lot. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it was exactly a setback, but when I was getting micromanaged for like one of the first times, I that was really hard for me. I think one because it made me doubt myself and what I know that I know and like so that that was honestly a very interesting time and I mean it ultimately led I left the organization because 
you know, it was making me doubt my value and what I brought to the table and, you know, just going further down the line with that, right? Um, and especially like that, it was, it was, because it made me doubt myself. So I think that was one of those interesting moments. And I wouldn't say exactly it was a setback, but it could have been. It could have easily gone down that road, right? Um, because I felt like I was advocating for myself and you know, I used the word explicitly you know, because you're not exactly you, and I told them, you are micromanaging me and they're like, no, I'm not. And so then for people to send me text messages and be chats and like emails and you know, all these things. So at that point, you know, it was becoming a setback and, and I said, like, this isn't going the way I know it can go and you know, being where I was feeling confident in, in that field. And so I chose to leave, right? I felt like, you know, I advocated for myself. I felt like I did everything that I could. And, you know, it was unfortunate because at that point I hadn't thought about leaving that organization. Um, but ultimately I was like, this isn't working. And so I left. Great story. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, very similar. Uh, poor management, you know, I think that's something that can really be tough. You know, if you have a, a manager that whether it's micromanaging you or, you know, hopefully not either like belittling you or anything like that, um, that's going to affect your work. You know, so you spend a lot of time at work and a lot of time is someone who's supposed to be, you know, your manager is supposed to build you up and make you the most successful possible. Like your job should be to, you know, get you paid, get you promoted. Really, that should be their job. So, um, and they should want that because your success is going to be their success. Uh, so I mean, I had, I had a poor manager towards the end of my time at Amazon, so I'm very excited to believe in um, because I had really great managers, uh, a couple of them, and then you know, just account transitions where things work and ended up with a new manager. And uh, you know, he was just not a great manager at all. And um, and it was the right time, I was going through some health issues at the same time, and you know, he made comments and it just it wasn't a healthy situation professionally, so uh. Yeah, that's why I looked elsewhere. So that uh, that'd be my biggest setback. But I'll say, you know, it worked out for the best. Like, um, so that's kind of like the moral and the underlying principles that you know if you do have these situations. You know, feel feel empowered to look elsewhere and know that there's you know always going to be better opportunities. There, there always is better opportunities. Um, it's just about finding. For me personally, um, it was. Um workload and being able to say no and like negotiating what's on your plate um I think in college for the most part like your workload is your workload um there's no there's not a lot of negotiation there um so being a young professional I wanted to say yes to everything I wanted to get as much experience as I could and um it just got to the point where it was 80 to 100 hour weeks and it just wasn't healthy um, again, had some poor management that wasn't like recognizing this and kept putting more things on my plate. Um, so I think I also ended up transitioning out of that role, but I think just like realizing you do have the power to go to your supervisor and say, hey, can you help me prioritize these things? I have eight hours a day. This is what, you know, what can we do to work this out? And, you know, that's not always the case, but I think just knowing like, this is my time, my health and my well-being comes first um, so that I am able to give 100% to this job and be passionate about it and curious and like grow um, and not overcommitting. So I think just like really respecting your time and your space and um, making sure that's known from the beginning. And I agree with everything that everyone said. Um, like I mentioned earlier, there's been a lot of transition at my organization. Um, so I'm actually also looking to transition out of the organization. I think it's been a good run, and I think I'm ready to move on um, in terms of like leadership and um, workload and things like that. Um, a specific example is just uh, when you're in charge of coordinating and managing the communications for an organization or a company, um, it can get really icky in terms of like leadership and higher ups, you know, telling you what should be said, what should be not said. And um, like I mentioned earlier, like that comes into like your values and your um, your norms, personal norms of like, does this feel right to me to say? Does this feel right to me to communicate to the community, to partners and funders? 
Um, and so I, I wouldn't consider it a setback, but I think that it is a has been a challenge for the last at least four or five months. So um, also looking to transition out. And like um, Luke said, there will always be something better. There will always be something that um, is more aligned with your values and morals. So don't be afraid. It might be scary. It is scary <laughs> trying to, you know, um, transition out. And especially because I've been there for so long. But um, I think scary is good. So I think we should be. Okay, before we kind of turn the tables again and have an opportunity for all of you to ask questions, I have one more. Right? And that is what suggestions or piece of advice do you wish you would have known upon graduation and would like to share with us? Like professionally or like in general? Yeah, I mean, I think that you should look at a whole person, right? So, whatever. I can go first. Um, I think professionally and as well outside, just like um, mm -hmm. Sancho's been saying the whole time, having confidence in yourself. Um, going into an interview, if you believe in yourself and you believe in that company's mission and values, I think that's really going to come across, as well as any situation. I think just showing up and giving the best that you have that day, uh, so many opportunities are going to come, come your way. And I think not every day showing up as your best is going to look 100%. Sometimes that's 20, sometimes that's 110, you know? But I think just showing up, being really open to opportunities and, and being confident in what you have and you have to offer, it has been really helpful for me post-graduation. Yes, I agree with Penny. And also, I think my biggest thing, my biggest piece of advice would be to be open to failure. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's really scary and sometimes cliche, but really, like, there's been a lot of times where I've failed at my job, not failed, but I've had, you know, um, not success at what I was supposed to be doing, or I had, you know, a lot of challenges on learning how to do that. And I would just say, you know, take that, that failure and, and grow from it and learn from it and um, accept it. And, you know, you're going to keep failing. It's not going to be just this one time that you're going to fail. You're going to keep failing. And I think the biggest piece of advice would be to just take that and grow from it and ask questions and um, learn from it. Learn from it is probably the most important. <laughs> I mean, I can go. Go for it. I mean, I think there's a, a lot that I I would love to give you all, right? Because you don't like at least for me, like I don't want to see other people struggle. Like, if there's something I can give you where you don't have to go through the same challenges as me, like please take it. Um, but I think with what Andrea was saying, really is a big thing, right? Like, you're gonna get rejected. Um, there's going to be things that maybe don't go the way you hope, but just having that, you know, that, re that rejection is just a redirection and that you grow when you're uncomfortable, I think is a big thing. And also just advocating for yourself and, and what you know you bring to the table and like what you want to see, um, because you know yourself is the best, right? And I think you're at a big time where a lot of people are giving you unsolicited advice and your family and other folks are probably like, why don't you just do this or do that and this and that. And it's, at the end of the day, you're the one that has to do it. And you're the one that has to take yourself to that job and drive to that job. And you know, you are the one that has to do it. Nobody else can do it for you. And so just making sure that it's what you want to do and not like, what your friends are doing or like what your parents are telling you to do or what your cousin said was really cool like it has to really be like what you see for yourself and what you want because at the end of the day you're the one that has to do it no one else can right so that would be i think one of those big things for me yeah yeah i think might be something similar to that it's just i think now's a like really critical time you know where you all are at to do some serious self-reflection on like what it is you want and and how those affect each other so i mean i i what i did and i'd recommend doing is like writing that down right and so like whether it's a certain you know type of job or a certain industry or 
you know, you just want to make as most 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 money as possible, and you don't really care what you do, right? I mean, that some people want that, right? It, it depends what you want, and then okay, how do those things play into each other? And because maybe, and then also another thing of that is location, because that's going to come into it, right? There's, I mean, a lot of opportunities in Colorado. We live in a great place, full of opportunity. Denver has a ton of opportunity. A lot of companies want to come here, so this is a great place to be. But not all the opportunities in Colorado, right? And maybe what you want to do, the opportunity really isn't in Colorado. And so, but is that important to you to stay here? And then how does that, you know, counterbalance with you really wanting to be in that job or really wanting to make X amount of money or whatever it is, right? And write that all out and figure it out because I think identifying that is going to help you stop yourself from limiting yourself and just opening yourself up to, you know, what it is you really want and what you need to do to achieve that, whether that's, you know, again, talking to certain people, pursuing folks in a certain industry, looking to move to a different state, whatever that may be. Dang, you've been terrific. So now can we just please be thinking about what you, you have an opportunity. We've got about 15 minutes left. We want to go to the deadline. So please ask. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about uh, like a professional aspect. I'm really interested obviously professionally i think sometimes it can be hard to perform when you're not at your best so i'm really interested to know how you guys have kind of stayed balanced and just taking care of yourselves and what your habits are stuff like that yeah i think i can go first um that's a really good question by the way um i think i so my with my organization we're allowed to work from home um two days a week and so I, for the first half, I'm in the office, and then for the second half, I'm at home. And so I think that's a really big um, plus for me is having that ability to not be at the office all the time, because that really does, honestly, having to be at the office so often kind of plays into your mental health a little bit. And so um, taking care of myself in terms of, you know, establishing that boundary of like, hey, like, I'm going to be working from home, I'm going to be online available, but I'm not going to be coming to the office. And then again, with the boundaries, um, boundaries with your coworkers. Um, I think in my experience, um, you know, you wanna build that, that community at your at your organization, at your um, job with your coworkers, but I think it's important to keep that professional boundary um, because I've seen uh, people who don't keep that professional boundary and it just gets really messy and there's just a lot of drama and there's, it's just not healthy for the organization or for you. So just keeping the, those boundaries with your coworkers and um, establishing boundaries with your supervisors, I think that's also really important. Um, I had the privilege of having a really cool and really awesome supervisor, and she understood the boundaries that I had as um, a worker, and um, micromanaging was one of those <laughs> boundaries for me. And so, um, yeah, just being advocating for yourself and taking care of yourself, um, whatever your needs are, is really good. I think finding an org organization that respects the people that work there and really values them. Uh, you know, if I'm able to tell my boss and I'm sick this afternoon or I have a headache, you know, and then maybe I could flex that time later. Maybe I'll just take that time off. Um, so I think just like having an organization where that pattern's already set, that people are able to take walking calls or, you know, I'm able to run a, run an emergency errand or things like that you know so i think just like finding an organization that respects those boundaries and has a healthy work-life balance is is huge yeah i think i completely agree with the boundaries i think you can get burnt out really 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 fast if you don't have like some sort of you know communicating in that these are my boundaries and I will not be answering your call after a certain time, right? And just knowing that you trust trust your team and that um, I really like what you were saying that they, that they respect you as a worker, as a human, um, and that they will look out for you, right? And going back into that professional side of things, like life happens, like we're human, um, we'll have things that happened, right? Like a few weeks ago, I had an emergency and, you know, my boss didn't even question me. She was like, yep, she's like, I'll cancel all your appointments. That was it. So it's like knowing that you're in a space that will also look out for you and respect your time off, really. And I know my organization right now, 
totally respect my time off. Um, and they, since I've been there, they don't mess it. Like they have this thing called trusted time off. And when you're on your time off, like you don't get any email, like any like phone calls to your personal phone number or any, I haven't experienced any of those things so far. And so, you know, when I disconnect, like that's the boundary that I have for myself. Like if I'm gonna go with my best friends or family or go on a trip, like I'll, I'll delete the apps if I have to, right? So it's just making sure that you also look out for yourself and, you know, be in a place that looks out for you as well, but also making sure that you put yourself as a priority and that you're taking care of yourself because that burnout can come very, very fast if you don't put those, take those precautions. Yeah, I think they covered it all. And I agree with 100% everything you guys said. Um, I'll just add, like, I think especially coming, you know, out of um, college and, you know, being your first career role after college, it's easy to, you know, really lean in and like, you know, I want to do the best and I want to be the best. And so I'm going to put in all these hours and, and you know, don't get me wrong. It's definitely important to, to do your best and to, you know, try hard, especially as you're learning a new role and all those things. But, you know, don't overdo it. So those boundaries, like everyone said, you know, know that when it's, you know, time to stop, it's time to stop. Like, you don't need to work till 9 p.m. to prove anything. Like, yeah, I mean, it, it will be there at the next and that being said, working till 9 p.m., you're going to wake up and you're not giving your best the next day. I think you're not going to have those fresh ideas or be 100% present. Uh, so, I mean, just like thinking in, in hindsight, too, like, is this extra hour really going to benefit me tomorrow or is just shutting the laptop off and um, engaging the next day the best route? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of like a kind of like a two-part question um did you guys all graduate csu and immediately like go and find an organization that you wanted to work for and did you regret like going and finding a job so fast and not taking time to just like enjoy life for a little bit okay yeah for sure. yeah so so i i did it i started you know i mean not right away there's a couple months in between there but you know pretty much um, I personally didn't regret it, but I think that that's a personal question that is probably different for everyone. Um, I personally didn't regret it. I was just ready to get going and make some money if I did not have money. Um, <laughs> so, so you know, that's kind of where I was, but, um, so no, I did, I didn't personally regret it. Uh, and I did start right after. Um, so I went undergrad, grad, and then I started four months after. I graduated and my first role, I very quickly, I was putting in all those hours. I got pretty burnt out. And so I did get a little bit of that regret, but then I joined this new organization that lets you take a month off if you want. And immediately I just felt like this, like relaxation, like I can live my life. I can still have these breaks, right? And like have that summer vacation if I want. Um, so I think just like if that's something that's important to you, finding an organization that allows you to have those flexible two periods of time off that you can travel, um, or you know, if you really desire that time off, then take it. I think it's just whatever is best for you. Yeah, I think similar. Um, if you're able to take the time off and that's what you feel like you need and you feel like you're at a place right where you can do that. Why not, right? Um, I always tell my students, especially the ones that are thinking about grad school and stuff, I, I always tell them, grad school is going to be there. Where is it gonna work? It's not gonna run away, right? It's gonna be there. And so if you need that time, if you need that break, and you're at a place financially, mentally, um, whatever that is for you, where you can do that, I say do it. Um, for me, my journey was a little, you know, I told y'all about how much of things the next six months, right? So when I graduated, I just took a, an internship with um, a nonprofit in Denver called Colorado Legal Services. And so that's kind of what I was doing. But then along the way, I've taken those gaps because the job search can be, you know, a little funny. So, but at the end of the day, I was really glad that I took those three months in between different jobs. Um, just to get a break, right? Because to be honest with you all, when I graduated, I was burnt 
out. So <laughs> I needed to figure out how to take care of myself, right? Because like I was sleep baby, I was with me like four hours thing. Um, maybe, maybe four, maybe five. <laughs> Um, and my college roommate's here, so she could tell you I did not sleep, okay? So um, that was really what I needed, right? So I was trying to make money because I was tired of not having money. But at the same time, like, I needed to figure out what was important to me, what I needed, like, how to, like, give myself a proper meal, how to go to bed and sleep a little bit more. Um, so I would say if you can do it. And then yeah, find an organization that that values that. It's the one that I'm at right now. Like we have this trust the time off policy, take unlimited time off. Um, and then they offer like sabbaticals to people that have been there for like five years. And so it's finding those places as well. And I agree with everything that they said. Um I when I got my job um four months after graduation. And I don't regret it. I think I was ready. I wanted to make money, like they said. And also, I think you can take time to find, because you've been a student for so long, right? You don't really have, like, outside, like, hobbies or outside, like, interests rather than being a student and, like, maybe working while being a student. Um, so, yeah, I think you can still have that balance of, like, finding what you like to do, who you are outside of being a student. Uh, but I don't regret it. And quick little plug, you can negotiate things other than salary, like you can negotiate time off. That's huge. Um, a lot of companies are way more willing to give you that if they're not willing to give you the price that you want. So just keep that in mind. Like the companies are willing to work, work with you on those things. So. Thank you so much. I, I will just throw in that I think that, you know, traveling can be a major investment in your life. Um, and so yeah. I believe that just like one might do an internship before searching for that full-time job or going to graduate school before seeking out that full-time job as well, traveling, going abroad, going to, to a few places that you've been yearning to refresh and reinvigorate your soul as well as your, your mind and heart, I think is be a really smart move um so you know i think that we all have to right yeah. i think you're all telling us that you have to do what's right for all of you yes okay so great question so appreciate you as an audience and thank you i can't from my soul you know thank you so much for coming i know that it was an effort and but we hope that we've made you feel welcome and uh, thank you so much. And um, please let us know if you, you know, want any additional connections with the students. And I guess students would just reach out, say to all of you that if there's someone here, please stop by the table now and let them know that you'd like to make an additional connection or get in touch with one of us and let us know that, and we'll definitely help you do that, okay? Thank you so much.